Hello and welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a professor at City University of New York, and my co-host today is Samantha Schnee, who many of you will recognize from our Week 9 program on what the future has brought to 21st century translation. Samantha is a prize-winning translator from the Spanish and founding editor of the indispensable web magazine, Words Without Borders. She's also a co-organizer of Translating the Future, the conference you are now attending. The humanitarian crisis in Venezuela is one of the worst on earth, made even more dire by the global pandemic. But it's been going on for so long, it barely makes the news. Venezuelans are slowly starving to death, with 90% of the country living below the poverty line, perilously short of food and losing weight. About 4.5 million Venezuelans out of a population of 32 million have fled, leading to a massive refugee crisis in neighboring countries. A situation as dire and prolonged as this one can lead to a phenomenon known as compassion exhaustion, in which the crisis itself is gradually accepted as a kind of norm. Doctors Without Borders has long done valuable work both inside Venezuela, where they have recently established a COVID-19 clinic in Caracas, and among Venezuelan refugees outside the country. One effective way to take action on behalf of Venezuela's desperate and beleaguered people is to support the work Doctors Without Borders is doing there. Words Without Borders, the web website I helped to found, published a special issue on Venezuela in 2014, when the situation there was already catastrophic. In that issue, you'll find Standing Stones, a haunting poem by Maria Auxiliadora Alvarez, translated by Catherine Hammond. It begins, everything I want to tell you, son, is that you should go through suffering. If you come to its shore, if its shore comes to you, enter its night and let yourself sink. Its gulp may drink you down, its foam overwhelm you. Let go, let yourself go. Everything I want to tell you, son, on the other side of suffering, another shore lies. You can read the rest of the poem and more wonderful work from Venezuela, including an interview with today's guest, Maria Jose Jimenez, on wordswithoutborders.org. Today's conversation in the 15th week of Translating the Future is the third and final installment in our mini series, Motherless Tongues, Multiple Belongings. We welcome writer and translator Janet Hong, who's joining us from Vancouver, Canada, poet and translator Pierre Joyce, whose collection of the earlier poetry of Paul Ceylon will be published next month by Farrar Strauss Giroux, and Maria Jose Jimenez, a writer and translator who is the current poet laureate of East Hampton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about these three wonderful people and their illustrious achievements on the Center for the Humanities website. As usual, a Q&A session will follow today's conversation. Please email your questions for Janet, Pierre, and Maria Jose to translating the future 2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. Translating the Future will continue in its current form through September. During the conference's originally planned dates in late September, several larger scale events will happen. We'll be here every Tuesday until then with the week's hour long conversation. Please join us next Tuesday, August 25th, for Language as Polis with Latasha Diggs, Marianne Newman, and Madeline Cohen. And keep checking the Center for the Humanities site for future events. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lachman and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. 
If you know anyone who is unable to join us for the live stream today, a recording will be available afterward on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to Janet, Pierre, and Maria Jose, we'd like to offer our utmost gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities, the Graduate Center CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Cullman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and PEN America, and especially to the masters of dark Zoom magic at HowlRound who make this live stream possible. And now, Pierre, Janet, and Maria Jose, over to you. Thank you, Esther, Samantha, for that introduction. Um, thank you to everyone who's here today. And thank you especially to Pierre and Maria Jose. Really, I'm so honored to be in conversation with you. Um, since our topic is motherless tongues, I thought it'd be good to start by discussing how we've arrived um, at the languages that we live and work in, um, or as I like to say, how we've come into our linguistic baggage. Um, in the spirit of transparency, when Alison Mark and Powell first invited me to be part of this roundtable, I was torn. Um, though I was super grateful for the invitation, I also felt incredibly uncomfortable talking about this topic because it surfaced so many anxieties for me um, around translation um, as an immigrant, a heritage translator, and a person of color. Um, all this to say, I'm actually very thankful for this opportunity because it forced me to do a lot of digging and inner work that I've been putting off for a long time. Uh, but before getting into the discomfort that I had to work through, that I'm currently working through, um, I'll begin by talking about my own linguistic baggage. Um, I was born in Incheon, Korea, which is a city that borders Seoul which makes Korean my mother tongue. Um, when I was four, our family moved to Seattle and then to Vancouver, Canada, where I attended kindergarten. Um, we moved back to Korea and I finished up kindergarten. I started um, attending elementary school there. And at the age of seven, we immigrated to Canada for good. Um, at the time of immigration, Korean was still my dominant language. Um, I had not yet acquired English, which meant that I had to go through ESL and, and all that. Um, but I very quickly assimilated. I lost my accent, became a Canadian citizen, um, and English became my dominant language. I continued to speak Korean at home, but I had stopped working at it by that point. I had stopped reading Korean books. Um, so Korean basically stayed at a second grade level for me and it was sort of relegated to the language of childhood. Um, in English though, it was my language of instruction. Um, I could articulate more complicated thoughts in English and though I'd always liked reading and I was always around books, it was actually in English that I fell in love with the act of reading. Um, um, I think the world of books became a haven for me. Um, and it was also in English that I dreamed of becoming a writer one day. Um, so I studied English lit in college. Um, I started taking some creative writing courses. And I think it was maybe in my third year of college that I had this major realization that I didn't know anything about Korean literature or Korea's literary history. And that being my, part of my heritage, I felt like I needed to find out so I took um, an elective, a Korean language course, and it was this course that actually changed the trajectory of my life. Um, for the end of term project, I, we had to take a short, a Korean short story and translate it into English. Um, this was a project. My mom at the time, she was reading a collection of short stories newly published from Korea and she loved it and she recommended that I translate, I try translating the title story of that collection. And it was through working on that story, uh, translating that first story, um, that I, I realized I could combine two deeply personal things about my identity. Um, the, the fact that I wanted to pursue creative writing um, and the fact that I was from elsewhere, from, from Korea. Um, so I finished that project, I, I submitted it. Um, and my professor actually encouraged me to submit it to um, uh, the Korea Times Modern Korean Literature Transition Contest, 
that's that's a mouthful but um but i did and to our utter shock i ended up receiving the the grand prize for that translation um and i have sort of been in transition ever since so that's my journey in a nutshell and just from our email exchanges alone it seems our stories and experiences of our mother tongue and our stepmother tongues are quite different. So, Pierre, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I am born by mistake in France, but 10, 10 days later, I wound up in Luxembourg, the country I was raised in and my parents are from, which means that my, my mama Lushen, my mother tongue, is Luxembourgish, which is a spoken language given as a dialect by most people. Uh, education in Luxembourg is in French and in German. Uh, you learn German, your alphabet in German, your ABCs come in German, and then French comes in uh, in the second school year as a foreign language. By the time sixth grade, things switch around. Everything has been in German, content-wise up till then, and this switches now and everything turns into French, except at high school graduation, you write one essay on German literature in German. Meanwhile, I picked up Latin, of course. Um, I had tried to learn Latin by learning the mass by heart at seven when I didn't understand a word of it to be an, an, a mass boy, you know, to, to do that. Uh, an uncle brought me to Spain during the holidays always. So I began learning Spanish and took Spanish lessons also in high school. Um, so I was really very confused in that sense of uh, the multitude of languages. When I thought I wanted to become a poet, a writer, this becomes a very complex uh, story for a Luxembourger. You have to choose either German or French. Now the cultural history there is interesting and important in that uh, depending on who were the last um, invaders, we tend to go with the other language. So the 19th century was mainly French invaders. So German was a favorite language. First World War and Second World War, we were invaded by the Germans. So French was more an, 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 a liked language. At the same time, there is a class thing going on. People who went just to primary school and dropped out in high school. Uh, so if you want the working class, uh, are much more familiar and easy with German because Luxembourgish as a language is a low German uh, descendant. Uh, the bourgeoisie, the more literary, the, the upper classes is much more Francophile. Goes to their holidays to France, uh, they also go to Germany. We would go to universities to different places of that order too. So there is a, really a complex uh, language structure when I thought of wanting to write, uh, it became uh, very complex because the first language I wrote in were actually little when I was a kid. I copied foreign language bits out of Karl May, the German uh, 19th century story writer, and they were in, Mes in, in, in Mescalero, Apache, in Comanche, in Persian, everything. I made a secret language with this. Um, what happens then, and I've written a fair amount of essays on this, is that uh, the, the, the mother tongue was un, unwritable. I never learned to write in Luxembourgish. You know, it's only after World War II that he began to standardize the quote dialect, made a dictionary. Now I get emails from friends in Luxembourgish, which I can't answer because I can't spell the language. I can read him, but I can't answer them. I haven't learned the spelling. So mother tongue uh, problem immediately. And I written about this later on and said, well, why do we have, what is that mother tongue and fatherland? Do we have to be in that Freudian mom, mommy daddy uh, triangle, right? Isn't there a way out of that? Well, when I was 15, I went to England for the first time and fell in love with an English girl. So the M of mother tongue dropped off. It became other tongue and then it became lover's tongue. And I said, why can't I write in the language to which I address myself, the person, the, you know, and so on. So to me, mother tongue became the lover's tongue rather. And I went to Paris to study bourgeois upbringing, French school, right? Uh, to do medicine, but I dropped down to become a poet because I had discovered American literature. 
uh, American culture, my grandmother had a movie house and we saw all the movies in English because they were Belgian distributors and Belgium has two languages, they, uh, Flemish and French. They couldn't dub the uh, two sets of films. So what they did was they left it in the original language but put two subtitles on in those two languages. But so I learned my American from John Wayne, which is very easy because he doesn't use many words, uh, and high school. Uh, my town is also called Patton Town because General Patton was the one who liberated it during the Winstadt Offensive in the Second World War. At the same time, he burned down my grandparents' house, so all the papers and books of my grandfather burned. So I learned some odd little thing. But we are very close friends to the American soldiers. My first trade in high school was buying used Playboy copies from the soldiers and reselling them in high school, right? Uh, so we were continuously in this cultural match, listening to the radio, listening to the AFN American Field Network station, which um, gave American rock and jazz. So there was a very complex cultural situation. In Paris, at school, I finally decided that yes, I did not want to write in French or German. I didn't think the writing that I was reading at that time was that interesting. But what really had interested me because I'd found Ginsburg and Kerouac and the Beats was American literature. And then I found Ezra Pound. When I opened the contours, it said, oh wow, if I wanna be a poet, then I really have, I can't do that on weekends as my father suggested, be a doctor and do this, you know, and said, so I dropped out, decided to write in English, came to America to go to college. The translating thing happens at the same time. The person who brought me to poetry in high school was Paul Celan, somebody who read the famous Todesfuge. When I moved to New York, I thought maybe I'll drop out. So I brought, I had three books, De la Grammatologie by Derrida, that had come out that year, Foucault's Les Mots et les Choses, and the latest uh, Ceylon volume. In New York, I sent, I sent 10 pages of translation of the Foucault and the Derrida to New York publishers. I'm still waiting to hear. <laughs> but the next year, when I had to do a dissertation at Bard College, I translated the Ceylon, and that got me going. So that Ceylon's word of trans for translator is, is uh, Fergendienst, ferry work, to ferry it over. And I felt that I brought Ceylon over. And as uh, Esther was saying earlier, uh, the last book is coming out next month. So it's 55 years that I have been translating them. While, of course, writing it, we can talk later, I think with Janet, we talked that the question of poetry, being a poet and a translator, and how those interact, how those work. But let me hand it over now to Maria Jose. Thank you, Pierre. And thank you, Janet. Um, I think our, our journeys are very different, but I see some parallels, some finding out as, as you're describing your, your, your linguistic baggage. I, I like that um, way of describing it because it really feels like uh, something I carry. And um, yeah, so my, my story is that I was born and raised in Venezuela and left at 16 to study in the United States. And so English became uh, this, this place that I was basically plunged into. Uh, I grew up very much in a mon monolingual uh, culture, uh, not for the most part, but where I grew up, it was monolingual Spanish, but I, I always had an interest in languages. So I was always um, doing courses like self, self-taught courses in, in German and uh, English and a little bit of French and and so I just had a natural uh, interest and and was also really good at it um, but when I when I moved to the United States I you know I, I learned really quickly that I didn't speak English I I had a grammar base but no no ability to understand what people were saying in different accents and mm -hmm. uh, even less to to speak it and feel comfortable in it so um went through the whole ESL uh, sequence of courses and then went to college and went into modern languages. So I studied French formally, French literature and Francophone literature and, and cultures, and, and then ended up immigrating to Canada. 
uh, and I landed on the on the west coast in Vancouver and Victoria, and uh, I began working as a um, as a translator, uh, helping someone who was a translator and needed help. And uh, all of a sudden, I am uh, helping to edit other people's translations. And very quickly, I realized that my Spanish had stayed behind. Uh, my language being my language of uh, English being my language of instruction, I, you know, had my my Spanish had stayed. Um, you know, it was very solid, but it was it had stayed at you know high school level, and so I decided to go back to school uh, and just take some courses in Spanish. Uh, by then, I had decided to move to Montreal, and all of a sudden began living in in French for the first time as well, and uh, also got to speak Spanish quite a bit, not just in class, but um, Montreal is is very much a trilingual city uh, where people speak English, French, and something else. So. Arabic and Spanish are the most common ones. And so I all of a sudden was functioning, living and functioning in all three languages and um, very much plunged into literary translation very quickly uh, because I met uh, Hugh Hazelton, who became my mentor and uh, he's a poet and translator. And, you know, here I was just thinking, oh, I just wanna brush up on my Spanish and some academic writing. And all of a sudden this entire world opened up uh, to get to know the, the community of Latino Canadian writers, uh, who I then, you know, became part of because I started actually sharing my work thanks to one of the authors I met, uh, through one of my classes and, uh, that completely changed everything. Just living in a trilingual place, first of all, uh, for the first time, I hadn't even lived in a bilingual place, uh, because Western Canada is mainly English. And uh, here I was exploring all three languages and, and they all sort of evened out, you know, um, Janet, you mentioned uh, how, how English was your dominant language. And I've, I've felt very much the, the, that way throughout my, my entire adulthood until recently, uh, because I've been spending a lot of time in the Canaries where uh, the variety of Spanish that's spoken there is very similar or a lot closer to Venezuelan Spanish than um, Peninsular Spanish might be. Uh, and so I've, I've felt very much at home in the last couple of years, just being immersed in the language that I grew up with, with a very familiar feeling. And um, I also began writing a lot more in Spanish. I've been writing um, in English and Spanish and a little bit in French for many years, but especially since I've been spending time in the Canaries, I've, it, it's, it's, it just continues to open up and it's been very enjoyable. And um, in terms of translation, I, I translate between English and Spanish uh, and from the French into the other two. Um, and let's see, what have I missed? I, I, I feel like language and writing and therefore translation have become um, as an immigrant or as a migrant, because I feel like I, I continue to go to new places and, and make myself at home or uh, they make me feel at home. Uh, I feel like migration doesn't ever end when once you've left your your motherland or your homeland. Uh, and so I feel like, at least for me, I, I carry a, a deep sense of loss, uh, but at the same time, incredible opportunity to gain from interacting with texts by other authors who um, you know, I gravitate towards because they explore themes that are um, themes that also come up in my writing or, you know, themes that I, I like to read about. So. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, Maria Jose, thank you for um, sharing your story. You know, your um, what you just said about that sense of otherness that you carry. Um, I think that's something that deeply resonates with me and I've kind of been thinking about um, um, being a heritage translator, a person of color, um, being an immigrant. What kind of concerns um, of my experience am I bringing into translation? And um, I just, maybe it's kind of related to the anxieties that surfaced for me when this subject first came to me. Um, and I just wanna actually read a, a quote that I've been sort of meditating on. 
Um, and it's um, by Madhu Kaza from Kitchen Table Transition, which has really become my Bible. Um, but she talks about the same anxieties that surfaced for her, how the discomfort with her discomfort with translation was connected to the trauma of integration. Um, and I'll just read it here. Something went quiet in me when I was brought to the U.S. from India as a child. Although I assimilated and lost my accent, a vital part of me got stopped at the border. My inner life remained untranslated. As an immigrant child, I felt an aura of illegitimacy about my claim to be an American. At times, I lived with radical insecurity. As an adult, when I translated from Telugu, my first language, which I'd learned to read in college, I experienced a repetition of the loss I felt as a child. And you kind of touched upon that, Maria Jose. Um, and I, this is something I think about a lot. Um, and I think um, Jampali Hiri in a, a New Yorker essay um, that she wrote about learning Italian, she, she wrote how her mother tongue is Bengali and living in a country where her language is considered foreign, um, she felt a continuous sense of estrangement her whole life. And in another essay, she refers to, she uses a word trespass, that she had this feeling of trespassing um, whenever she would read English books as a child. Mm -hmm. So I've been sort of um, thinking about, you know, what what makes me unique as a, as a translator of color. Um, and I think it's kind of, it's, it's like what you said, it, it's a, it's a strength and also a weakness. My sense, my abiding sense of otherness, which I haven't really been able to shake off. Um, like even my initial move to the U S and Canada, um, obviously because I couldn't speak English at the time, but even when I was so young, I, my, my earliest memories actually re reinforced this sense of otherness that I felt. And even when I moved back to Korea, even though there was no language barrier, I, I lived with the sense of otherness, of being different, being exposed to maybe a different culture, a different country at a young age. And then obviously the immigration back to Canada, going to ESL, um, and even though I worked very hard at assimilation, it's, it's that sense of otherness I, I haven't been able to shake throughout the, throughout the years. Um, and, and like I said, it's both bad and good. Bad because it makes me sometimes super insecure about, about, um, about English and I, it's, it makes me second guess myself all the time. Um, I doubt myself. I, it kind of feeds into my um, almost obsessive perfectionist tendencies. I have to check everything to make sure I have this um, mastery over the language. Um, but the good thing is that it gives me sort of a unique perspective that wouldn't have been av available to me had I been an insider who just kind of um, takes the world as it is. But I, I, I feel like my, my position as like an outsider, it, it enables me to see certain things that I wouldn't have seen. Um, and also informs my, my selection of, of things to translate as well. Because of this abiding sense of otherness, I gravitate towards narratives that that feature marginalized you know the marginalized um the disenfranchised broken imperfect people the unremarkable the odd even um this short story that i translated that always sticks with me um there's this there it features this this female gymnast who can't perform her sport anymore because she goes through this major growth spurt you know these odd odd characters and and i love stories like that where um and i love authors um who write about these kind of characters um, rather than than characters who are accustomed to privilege and power um so yeah even um P uh, pierre you were talking about how you, when you first moved to england you dropped the the m uh, um, yeah. from your mother tongue and it, it became the other so I I see that even in your story there's this preoccupation with otherness um, do you want to kind of talk about how that has informed your writing or your practice sure I think uh, for, the, for a long time I have been 
completely involved early on, probably with some anxieties, and I'll read you a short poem about language anxieties, because those anxieties enter the writing as much as um, a, a, anything else. But then I, I have a book of essays called The Nomad Poetics. And the nomadicity is not just traveling as we all do, have done and as we can do, but it's also that nomadicity in, of languages. And I have theorized the notion of betweenness, uh, that we are always between. Uh, one of my books is called Barzakh, which is the Arabic term for the afterlife, uh, for the betweenness as we travel through. And I think when we look closely at any given language, there is no such thing as a language that is, I know your anxiety, Janet, the purity, you want to learn that language perfectly. In fact, all languages are impure and the greatness of language is that it is, it is alive as long as it, as it can be enriched and is continuously being enriched by what writers do, what translators do, what the people, the kids on the block do, inventing the new languages. My Arabic translator, uh, sent me an email an hour ago saying, I absolutely have no idea what you're talking about in uh, that expression uh, that I'm using. And it was actually a street word uh, I, I, and I, I brought in, and I'm going to have to write her a long explication of what that term can be. And it is, of course, untranslatable into Arabic because it is an, a kind of New York uh, abbreviation of something that's, you know, that's not there. So uh, to me, the the multitude of languages and the, 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 the traveling is a great delight. Now, I may also say probably that as a white male, I have a certain prerogative in terms of the way I've been able to move around the world, you know, relatively easily. But they're wonderful situations. I wind up, one of my first gigs was in England. I was teaching English as a second language to American Latino uh, officers at the uh, Air Force Base, at the American Air Force Base, uh, hired by the University of Maryland to, to do that. Who is I, as a Luxembourger, with the weirdness to wind up teaching, you know, the, the things. So, but I've always loved those, uh, the craziness of those uh, situations. Uh, all languages are also colonized. There is no pure language. Over the years, one has learned that there is no such a thing as a, as, as a, as a pure, clean language. Languages are all mixtures, are all mestizoed in a profound way. And that is what gives their richness. You know, American language is any number of languages spoken differently, used differently. And that is the pleasure of it. One would not want to hear some kind of standardized, pasteurized language, though, as people who came into a foreign language, as you said, Janet, we are, our tendency would be to be careful. We don't want to be caught uh, saying something wrongly in that given language. Let me read you that short little poem called Anguish, a Riddle, that all the languages are borrowed. But how then do I count them that do not belong to me? In the first one, I think, in the second one, I sink. The third is my rhetoric and the fourth, my west and wagon its wheel at least traces these steps in harmonies of tetradic modalities before and after I sink. So the think and the think is that old thing that you can still hear in my speech, THs in English after more than 50 years I still mess up some, uh, some, uh, sometimes. So that poem is about the THs. I'm so fascinated noticing, um, just hearing you both speak of, in a way we come up with strategies, right? To exist in this in-betweenness that is um, speaking an other tongue. And uh, I, I relate to both, both of your your strategies or, or where you've come to. Uh, I was really, um, when you said, Janet, about the, the characters that you're drawn to in, in the, the work that you choose to translate. Uh, I actually, I share that, but I think I, I tend to gravitate towards work that uh, 
is very rooted and embodied and uh, uses language to, to explore this in-betweenness, but in a sense, um, looking at people and places deeply and, and creating a sense of intimacy with the world and with the body that uh, is sort of inescapable. And that's, that, that's been a bit my strategy as a, um, as a writer and as a translator and just basically inhabiting this world where I'm always moving around and moving between language, ling like different linguistic spaces and different combinations of languages. And um, in a way I, I have created or, or have, I have chosen to see language and writing since I was little as a, as a place of escape and as a place of um, where I could retreat to as a refuge. Uh, and I was always an avid reader and, and I've noticed that um, even in my own writing, it's, it's sort of this place that I can carry with me. Uh, it's a place it, that I can enter whenever and wherever I am. And the authors that I feel drawn to, um, especially the authors that I feel like, that I, that I feel compelled to translate, often address the, the problem of displacement, the problem of being marginalized or being left out. And, and one of the ways that at least I sense them or I receive them exploring these issues is through actually creating more connections with, with specific things like the body or the land or uh, plants or animals and, and going, going into these worlds and uh, recreating something. And, and in a way for me, my writing as part of my translation practice, because now they're, they're really um, inseparable has become a place of reconnection where uh, for a long time I was translating other, other people's work as a way to avoid writing my own work because it felt uh, like this impulse that once I started, I wasn't going able to, I wasn't going to be able to stop. And that's, that's actually what's happened that I'm basically spending all my time uh, either writing or translating and, and I really can't stop and I, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a problem. Um, but uh, one, of the, <laughs> one of the beautiful things that's happened is that now I'm translating my own work and, and not only translating my own work, which I wasn't able to do for a long time, is that now a lot of the poems come out in both languages at the same time. And I'm like trying to catch up and, you know, writing as quickly as I can because I feel the other language, whether it's Spanish or English, I feel it like as I'm writing, like coming out at the same time. And it's really frustrating sometimes, but... Do you have to you have to make it two poems? Can't you put both into one poem and make both languages mix up and I do that I do that a little bit, yeah. Um, sometimes a line will only want to be in one language or the other. Mm -hmm. um, but you know I, I can read you uh, an example, uh, a recent example uh, of a poem that came out in Spanish. This is uh, maybe from a couple of months ago or where I was in. I was in Gran Canaria and again, very, very rooted in the land and in the, um, uh, where is it? Uh, yes. Uh, very rooted in the land and in what was um, in front of me, the, the plants that I was touching, the dirt. Uh, and I'll read a little bit of the poem in Spanish and then I'll read the, the whole poem in English. Oh, and uh, this is this is part of a series that has become uh, like all of my poems fall into this uh, translation or prayer series now, um, and they always have a subtitle. This one is Traducción u Oración para la Memoria. Hoy recordando un nuevo amigo cuyas ramas perfumaron mi tarde, mis manos, mi cabello, me lancé una nueva búsqueda. Le pregunté a mi madre la mejor manera de pegar palitos de un romero que quise propagar para olvidar, para compensar mi no saber, el haber fallado en tantas cosas. I'll read the English. I wrote this poem um, soon after 
George Floyd was killed. And um, this was a way that I found to, to root my, my anger and rage and sadness, uh, being so far away from what was happening here. Um, so translation or prayer for remembrance. Today, reminiscing about a new friend whose branches perfumed my afternoon, my hands, my hair. I launched into a new search. I asked my mother for the best way to root cuttings from a rosemary bush I wanted to propagate, to forget, to make up for my unknowing, all my failings. For example, attempting to root a tip from a fig tree I cut on a morning walk. I didn't know it's best to take a cane, ripe with tender buds, in another season, on another moon. I don't think this cutting will survive. I don't think this cutting will survive the present crisis of fires, tremors, and death. But knowing that in my absence, its hundred year old mother will still guard the gulch that young and old shrubs will watch over the sleeping grapevines, almond trees, and tunas, will no doubt lengthen my years. I will, gra I will wax gracefully, my memory swollen with new tongues, sweet with triplets, scions, and roots, with the fresh air we breathed without a knee to the neck. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, so that, that's just one, one example of a poem that felt really urgent and just came out in, in both languages. And um, I do thank my, the, the authors I translate for inspiring me and encouraging me to, um, to inhabit this in-betweenness. Um, and I wonder if, um, uh, especially you, Janet, um, but both of you, if you if, whoever wants to, to go there, uh, where your writing and translation meet, mm -hmm. and how you how you see that. And I know we could be here all day, but <laughs> for sure. Well, I um, something that you said, Maria Jose, about how um, even when you're writing now, or the the transition your transition practice and your your writing practice, they're they're both sort of um, wanting your attention they're both kind of you see the you, you feel their pressure um like how did you get to that point where they're both there um because i feel like i need some of that to like summon my writing because i feel like for me when i'm working on doing a lot of translation my my writing is sort of um um it's hindered or there it's almost damaging it almost harms my my writing if I'm doing a lot of translation and I haven't been able to find that balance. So if you guys could speak to that, that would be amazing. Uh, I don't know. I was thinking in terms of what Maria Jose said in re the relation between translation and and um, and writing and how we go about it. I think what I have done or tried to do over the years is to annul the difference. And one way of that I come, I could think, I could come through it in a thinking way is to realize that all language is translation. That is, there is something before language, you know, and whatever comes into language is translated from somewhere so that all language is translation, which means that all writing is translation. And that means that the kind of literary translation we're doing is only a sort of special unique case and that you can also treat that way. Then for example, if you go into, into translation studies and you look say at how Ulipo translates uh, or an example of something I did, I translated uh, Unika Zürn's poems, which are based, she takes a line by Henri Michaud takes all the letters in the French line and writes a German line out of those letters, right? So that, that's a poem. How do you translate that? I can doubly, I translate her line and then I go and I take Michaud's line 
and use her method, you know, using all the French letters in and make an English poem out of it. So then you have to, now there are a hundred ways that Ulipo invented such matters. Uh, you know, um, an old friend passed by now, but that Canadian, you may know BP Nickel. Uh, BP wrote a lot around translation, did a lot of work in those areas. So I think an, an ongoing practice of transformative writing is always translation and always, you know, comes in, uh, uh, comes in that way. And that's what kind of permitted me to some extent to, to, to if not come to peace with the question of poet, translator, you know, um, what comes first or so. No, they're both there continuously and they feed each other. The one good thing about translation is that if you don't have anything to write or the poem doesn't come, you can always translate. And I'll answer very quickly. Um, for me, um, I, I remember a, a sort of before and after. Um, I was translating some work by um, a Montreal author. His name is Alejandro Saravia. I was read, translating his novel and it was really painful. There was very heavy... Um, content, political violence, and I found it excruciating. And it was also very challenging. It's a multilingual uh, um, novel. And, and I remember before that time, I tried to translate my own poems and I, it, it literally made me nauseous. And so I wrote and just put my stuff away. And, um, and then while I was translating this, this work, I felt like I really had an impulse to pay attention to what was coming out that was my own, like my own thoughts, my own ideas uh, that were not necessarily related to what I was, um, to, to what I was translating, but it, something was calling for my attention and I gave it space. So I always had a notebook next to me and I would just jot down notes. And I also felt compelled to write to the characters in the novel. And then I started doing this thing where I, I would either write a poem or, or write a short prose piece addressing uh, the characters in the pieces that I was translating. And, and that has been going on for a while. And a lot of new work has come out that way. Um, and it felt like at the beginning, it felt more like a, like a cleanse, like, a, like a, a space that I was creating to calm my nervous system <laughs> down from, you know, mm -hmm. both the, the intensity of the deadlines and of the content that I was that I was treating and mm -hmm. and then it just sort of became a you know second nature that I'm I'm always giving my writing space and and now it's sort of unavoidable I can't I can't look away um, so maybe that 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 might work just 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 opening a little bit uh, of space and then just seeing what happens mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, th that's th this has been an incredible conversation, and I'm sorry that we're interrupting now uh, <laughs> this extremely beautiful exchange between the three of you. Uh, but we do have some questions, and um, the first one is from Samantha herself. Well, I wanted to ask each of you if you think you have different personalities or perhaps identities in different languages, either as a writer or in your daily lives? And if so, do those differences reflect the personalities of the languages that you're living and working in? Hmm. <laughs> That's a complicated question. Do we have another hour? <laughs> That's a great question. I feel uh, that it's a question yeah. for novelists. As a poet, uh, that 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 sense is uh, is relatively strange to me, or I don't have it, or I'm in the language in such a way where I don't think of a personality of my personality, uh, where I'm more looking at the language. Does that make sense to Samantha? <laughs> I, you know, I. Well, that's all I can say. <laughs> Ladies, pick it up. <laughs> For me, I, I would say uh, it's not so much a, an issue of identity or personality, I feel like I, in Spanish, I, I write in a more, 
uh, like bodily way. Like I'm just more in, like it is, you know, my mother tongue, my la the language of my heart. I am more directly in touch with my emotions. And I think not always better able to express, but better able to access the impressions that something left that I, that are calling me to write. And in English, I get carried away playing with sound and rhythm and uh, playing with the language itself. Uh, it, whereas in Spanish, I might be more driven to pay attention to images and impressions and uh, feeling and, and how the language, uh, not so much how it feels in my mouth, but more uh, the effect it's going to have. Or, or that I think I want it to have, even if I fail at it. And Janet? For me, I think um, because, as I mentioned before, my Korean stayed at a, a second grade level, um, um, and I never actually studied Korean after that. Um, so when I, when I speak Korean, when I'm working with Korean, um, in, in some ways, I still feel like a child. Um, and I, I take in the words and the sounds of the words almost like a child. It's, it's kind of, um, it feels different at, whereas English is my language of education, of instruction. So I feel like I could articulate, a, you know, I could talk about literature. Whereas in, in Korean, I mean, this is so funny as a, as a translator that I can't talk about literature in <laughs> Korean, but, but I think it sort of plays into even, um, my translation and writing practice as well as I, when I translate I am in awe of the author's skills and I get so absorbed and sort of pulled into that language and, and there is a part of me that feels like I can never live up to um, to what they're doing so there is that that tension that is always at play um, maybe I'll t I will take Maria Jose's advice and go <laughs> study some Korean finally <laughs> um, so that they can sort of the two languages kind of um, be dominant or to match. But, but yeah. We have another question that came in via Gmail. It's sort of a double barreled question. Um, the first part is just for Janet, but I think it would be interesting to ask it of all three of you. Um, the question is after winning the translation contest, Janet, how did you go about improving your translation skills? Did you take any classes or were you more self-taught? And then the second part of the question is for all three of you. And that is how do you keep your finger on the pulse of the literary scene in all of your languages? Um, so after I, I won that, um, that contest, um, I was sort of my, my professor was shocked. We were, we were both in shock and I was sort of thrown into translation. I, um, I took some graduate seminars, but they were workshops in translation. So I didn't really formally study literary translation or translation studies. So I was in a few workshops, um, but I have to say it's sort of been um, my approach to translation has been kind of homespun. Um, if I have questions about the text, I often go to my, my mother and I ask her, you know, what does this mean? Um, um, I ask a lot of my Korean friends. Um, um, so, yeah, and, and um, I didn't mention this in my, in my brief interaction, but I did do an MFA in creative writing. So I feel like as I worked um, and studied other people's, people's writing, uh, other writers that I admire, um, I think it sort of informs also my, my transition practice and, and kind of lets me see um, the possibilities of language. And, and what about the other two of you? Did you study translation formally? Um, I did um, study later on. After, after graduating from Bard, I got jobs translating into French, Kerouac and others, but that was to make a living. Then when I was set up in London, uh, in order to get some money from my father, I went back to the university and I did an MA in translation studies, but on work that I had already translated. And 15, 20 years later, I did a doctorate at SUNY uh, Binghamton on my Ceylon translations. I had already done the, the translation. I just added an, a volume to it. So it was always a mixture. 
early on, it was like ma trying to make a living. That was my early crazy idea that you could make a living as a literary translator, <laughs> but I only wanted to translate poetry I liked. No way paying the rent <laughs> that way. Uh, so, you know, so it came, came in that way. And I learned about it. I learned the theory a bit when I started teaching at the university at U Albany and I offered the graduate course in translation. That's when I began um, looking more seriously at what had been written about it. But I had already worked with Jerry Rothenberg. Uh, we did those anthologies, the poems from Millennium anthologies, or we were doing those at the same time. So the, the complexity of thinking about, learning about, and teaching it and doing it all were there at the, simultaneously, really. And you, Marija? Um, yeah, for me, um... So I, when I went back to school, I went to Concordia University in Montreal. I took a couple of workshops. Uh, well, one was more of introductory uh, class, uh, introduction to translation with Hugh Hazelton. That's where I met Hugh. Uh, and then there were, I think there were maybe a couple of other workshops and I just like went right into it. I started doing like independent studies and then my projects for the classes would be uh, translating short stories or poetry and you know I, I it was very natural for me and and you know Hugh said that I was very good at it and so I just kept doing it and um, then I did some formal studies in more professional translation uh, at McGill but that included some stylistic uh, a, a couple of classes that had style that looked at style and stylistic differences between the languages that also helped me in my literary translation. And then I, I started an MA in translation studies at UMass Amherst uh, when I moved here uh, to Massachusetts. Um, and, but it was more focused on in theory or I, you know, I, I, I dropped out. I'm a, I'm a proud grad school dropout. Um, <laughs> but the, the first courses, the first core courses that I took were more in, in theory and I, I just wanted to translate. So, I dropped out and just kept translating. So it's definitely like a lot more self-taught, uh, but I've had plenty of opportunity to confirm my, you know, where I'm going either by people that I, that I work with and definitely more recently, the last few years, I've been co-translating with uh, a colleague and friend, Anna Rosenwong. And I feel like I'm becoming a worse translator now because she's so good. Um, you know, we are a really good team, but I, because we have each other, I, I'm basically like, I'm not completing my work. So, but I'm learning a lot there too, um, as uh, working with, with a co-translator. And how about the other part of the question about keeping your finger on the pulse of all of these various different literary cultures that you're all inhabiting? My answer is very short. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I try to stay in touch with some of the people. I did a lot of work from North African literature because I'd gone there. I lived in Algeria for a number of years, translated. Uh, this to me was also a wonderful discovery because the French that I was translating from was a multi-language thing, you know, that had Arabic and Kabyle going through it. And I keep in touch with the friends there and so on and try to, to stay there. To add something that the, there's a problem, not so much for the translator, but for the people who read the translation. When we drop a beautiful poem or novel from a culture that nobody knows anything about, it falls into a strange place because we can't bring along all the necessary information to make it readable inside of a wider culture. And that's a very frustrating thing. One keeps reading, one keeps, I try to keep connected with the culture I'm translating from, but that is very difficult to carry over uh, beyond the very limited specific text that I'm translating. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have experiences of that order of, I wanna bring Korean knowledge about these matters <laughs> over. Gossip and uh, you know, uh, film, uh, you know. The, uh. um, as for me, I actually um, try to foster really good um, relationships with Korean publishers and also my Korean, the, the writers that I translate. Um, and they sometimes tell me about a new book that's come out, um, and then they'll, I'll be the first one to know before anybody because 
um, they are in that scene. And sometimes publishers will also, um, I will just kind of follow their Instagram or their Twitter feeds and see what new books are coming out. Um, and that's how I sort of stay connected. Okay, do we have time for one more question? Last one. Um, and this is also from Gmail. I wonder whether there isn't a new canon emerging of works based on the in-between languages principles you three have been discussing. I know Janet mentioned Madukaza's anthology Kitchen Table Translation. Are there other works you think of as key texts and inspirations that you would recommend? <laughs> <laughs> um, read my nomad poetics and uh, a couple, about three volumes of essays on translation I have. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, all my unpublished poetry. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. And I guess you also mentioned Jhumpa Lahiri. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And there was another writer that you brought up in our earlier conversations, in addition to Jhumpa. Um, I think it was from an anthology. It was the bilingual, oh, I forget the title. It's about creativity, but I mean, there are so many writers who kind of work with different languages. Um, Jampa Lahiri, whom I love, but there's also Yian Li. Um, she, she says wonderful things about translation and working in, in writing in her, her second language. Um, um, you can find a lot of her essays online and in the New Yorker, but um, you just have to do a search and there, there are so many, so many texts. I would like to add Jerome Rothenberg's notion of total translation and his anthologies from Native American materials and so on are still to me very, very interesting. His translation of Navajo Ho songs, all that material, all that thinking through the richness of cultural traditions is very useful still today to me. And that gives us a chance to close out this whole sort of mini series of Beyond the Mother Tongue with the mention of uh, the UCLA professor Yasmin Yildiz, whose book um, uh, literally called Beyond the Mother Tongue, uh, it was the inspiration for Bruna Dantes Lovato's panel, which has then in turn inspired our three talks, uh, of which, alas, this is the last because there's so much more to say on this subject. And um, you've been an absolutely gripping uh, uh, conversation between the three of you. Um, uh, but alas, we've run out of time, so we have to say goodbye. Uh, before we do, I'd like to thank our partners again HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center, CUNY the Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. And uh, today, especially, uh, we have to thank LTI Korea, which has provided uh, some special support for today's program. Um, and most of all, uh, many thanks to my Jo Pierre and Janet for sharing uh, this wonderful, wonderful moment with us. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.